Havana has. Urban development in Havana is there today in among the ruins, unfortunately because of Castro. There's what they call unforeseen or unthought of uh, consequences. So when Castro came, he destroyed democracy, he destroyed the republic, he, he made a bureaucratic dictatorship that was cruel. But inadvertently, he froze the city. It's a 1950 city today in 2010. And luckily for Havana, it wasn't destroyed by ugly modern buildings. Because most modern architects, and some are not, but most, have no feeling for the neighborhood, have no feeling for the beauty of the city. And so that Havana has preserved itself as a beautiful, beautiful city. I talk about in the book, and we did, the string of parks. There's actually not grand parks. There's no central park in Havana. But there's a string of parks. You know, the fraternity park, and then you go into the uh, capital park, and then you go into central park, and then you go down to the Prado, and then you go to, to the, uh, to the every, you can go continuously through the city. And as Carlos Alberto said, it's not only the central city, but it's the neighborhoods outside of the central city. See, under the present regime, if you're a tourist, and this is true in all communist countries, they fool you. Someone, someone just told me they came back from Havana, it's a beautiful city. If you go to Havana today as an American tourist, you have to have a government guide, a government car, or a government bus. And you have to go, you stay at the National Hotel, and you have a late breakfast, and then you're taken to the old city, and you're taken through a street or two of restored buildings, beautifully restored, meticulously restored, great Spanish colonial architecture. And you're amazed. And then you go in the plaza of the cathedral and you're stunned, see? And then you're taken back to the hotel, you go swimming, you take a nap, you go that night to the Tropicana, and then you come back and tell your friends, boy, it is a paradise. But what they don't tell you is a few blocks from the old city or in the old city are 20 families living where one did. You'll see destroyed neighborhoods. But the beauty of Havana isn't the preservation of the old city, which a lot of people will do when it's liberated. They'll say, well, we'll save the old city. Havana is a city of millions that, are, that live in a beautiful neighborhoods. There's the uh, boulevards in residential neighborhoods that you know, and they're in the book, with shade trees and benches and promenades. And you can go out and talk to your friends. You could have your children. You could have a dog. You can you could take a nap in all these little linear streets that are part of neighborhoods. So the secret of Havana is neighborhoods, which reflects on people. Now, I visited Havana uh, three times. The first time, I was in high school. I was a senior in high school, went with a buddy, and that was in 1947. And there was no greater place for a senior in high school to go in the world than to Havana. It was the most it was the playground of the world. There was no city in the world. You could go to any city in the world. There was nothing as beautiful and as exciting and as entertaining and, and as Havana. And then we went to the Tropicana, and I said, wow, like I did tonight. And uh, I was thinking of being an architect. I was an artist, and I didn't do it. And, uh, The music and, of course, the gambling and the, they had gambling, so much gambling that I remember staying up late and we became friends of one of the coupiers. And the San Suse, which you may remember as a great club, had a smaller casino behind it 
where the coupiers and the dancers could lose their money that they were paid to entertain in the first club. So they had an entertainment club, so everybody lost. But for us, it was exciting. And we stayed at the National Hotel. And as I, I wrote this in the book, and I said, I never forget when I looked up in the crystal room in the Tropicana, which was these giant glass arches, there was a banyan tree, and all of a sudden lights go on, colored lights, beautiful girls are dancing. And I saw this one beautiful girl right out of Spain, see, right out of the, uh, the Moorish culture, Andalusia. With long, beautiful legs dancing a Latin beat in that tree. Then I went back with my beautiful wife, Helene, in 19, Helene, help me, was it 67? 67. 57. Now, Batista was still there, Castro was, was in the hills, and the city was still there. The footprint of the city was the same. The neighborhoods were the same. Everything was the same. But there was a certain tension in the air. And I was, uh, I photographed all the time. And this time when I raised a photograph, a gun came up to, to mirror my accident. I didn't photograph it. Just a, a simple place. I wasn't a spy. But I went with a line. We stayed at the Nationale, so that was the same. And we went to the Tropicana. And that nightclub was still great. They didn't, they still had the gambling. And we went in and saw that show, and up in the glass, the colored lights came on, and I saw that same girl. Same long legs, same dance. Now, in 1997, with Ben Leuter, who was a great writer and a friend and my son and daughter-in-law's uh, father-in-law, father, I went back, he's a writer, and I went back to Cuba. We stayed at the Nationale. They had restored it. So it was just like it was. And uh, I was determined to document the way people lived under Castro. Because I made the foolish mistake to think that Castro was going to die. And I got a hunch that he's going to outlive me. Because every year, people say, this is the last year. This is the last year. And uh, so far, it hasn't happened. But I said, boy. I'm living in a time when people are living in this dictatorship. I have to <clears throat> capture that on film. So I went into people's homes, and at first, and I had a, our government gave me an architect who was very uh, sympathetic, and he took me around, and we had a black market car, black market gas, black market driver. We had black <laughs> windows on the window, because you're not allowed to take an American unless you're a government guide. So we went, and we went into these neighborhoods that uh, we then went and took pictures. So I set up, I got into a courtyard of an old Spanish home that was beautiful architecturally. And I looked, I had this two or three people helping me, and I looked into the camera, and I saw a lady on a balcony. Nice looking lady, and she was perfect for that scene. And then, I was adjusting my camera, I looked down and she was gone. I said, this reminds me of the Arab countries where they don't want their picture to be taken. In fact, I was chased once, I think, in Cairo for blocks. That little old lady with the cane almost caught me, and I was young in those days. <laughs> I then said, well, that's it, and I started to take the picture and I looked down and she was back on the balcony with a red hat on. She had gone in her apartment, put her hat on. I got to know her, and she invited us to come up, and I then photographed her living room and asked her if I could photograph the bedroom, and she said yes. And from that time, every time we went into these very, very poor, very uh, dilapidated mansions, I always photograph people in their homes and always ask them if I could photograph them in the bedroom. And the, the photo, I did a book, Habanero. Someone tonight said they had uh, got the book. But uh, the beautiful thing was that each bedroom was sad. The paint hasn't been painted in 50 years. 
The mirrors were cracked. 